Okay, so for the last part of the High Renaissance, we're going to do our last artist for the High Renaissance, and that's Raphael. And then afterwards, we're going to talk about uh, the Venetian style, which, although you might not recognize the artist as much, will actually be more influential um, than the artists we've looked at so far. So kind of important to cover them. So this is a really kind of early piece from Raphael called The Marriage of the Virgin. Uh, he was born Raffaello Sanzio. Um, you can kind of see why he would change to the one name uh, that's being used. Sounds more artistic, right? He was a student of Perugino. Um, this particular piece is signed right in the temple, so he's doing that Michelangelo thing, uh, except this case it's Raphael that did it. Um, the particular story that's being portrayed here, Marriage of the Virgin, is a continuation of um, that idea of the cult of Mary um, that continues to be promoted by many people at this time. So uh, what it talks about is the story from the Golden Legend, uh, so it's not in the Bible. Uh, the Golden Legend, as I had mentioned before, is basically um, a set of stories. Some of them are like kind of mythologies that are from France, like Arthur and that kind of stuff. And then other ones are just kind of extending the biblical stories. So in this one, um, they make this kind of romantic story about the meeting of Mary and Joseph. Joseph, uh, Mary is going to... Um, betrothed the person who was able to make flowers come out of a flowering staff. And you see this, this dude failed, he breaks his staff, but if you look really closely, you can see the flowers on Joseph. So Mary's impressed and they decide to get married. Um, so it's a sweet story. Um, and you probably kind of recognize the style because we looked at Perugino's work um, towards the end of the um, early Renaissance and same sort of things are going on, just this super huge rational space. Um, maybe you think the student is better than the teacher, uh, the student is certainly more famous, uh, but the same sorts of things are going on. But eventually Raphael, he saw, especially what Leonardo uh, was doing, but also Michelangelo later on, and was really impressed um, and started to change his style. And he came be, became known um, specifically for making Madonna. So in other words, Mary, um, sometimes with the child Jesus. Uh, and in this case, we have Mary, the child Jesus, and then we also have um, John the Baptist. And we can tell it's John the Baptist because even though he's a little baby and looking all clean with his curly cues, uh, he's wearing this uh, animal cloak. So that tells us it's John the Baptist. And Jesus looking super chill in this one. Um, this particular painting was restored uh, over this period of 10 years. So you can kind of see it's a pretty small painting, uh, but they took it very seriously. Um, from a destroyed version um, in the house of Lorenzo Nazi. Uh, so I'll include the link to this restoration story if you're interested in how they took this painting from what you see here on the left uh, in a very damaged canvas. Um, and then turned it into this. Uh, so <laughs> very difficult process. Uh, some of it's fixing and some of it is actually repainting some of these empty spaces, but the result uh, I think would work really well. By the way, you may have noticed that a lot of these pieces are in the Galleria uh, dei Uffizi in Florence. Um, and generally when we look at Renaissance pieces, especially these high Renaissance ones, they're in Europe. Uh, when we get to later styles, we'll see that a lot of them are in the United States. Renaissance paintings, there not, are not as many in the United States um, just because it was really popular in Europe, so people didn't want to sell things. Um, but what we see with later styles, we'll see that a lot of stuff is in the U.S. because they weren't popular at first. Um, so this particular one was found in a destroyed house, but the painting survived, so Raphael gets what he wants. Uh, and he was really influenced, uh, like a lot of people, uh, by seeing this cartoon uh, which was displayed to artists. Um, I think it was only displayed like once or twice, but the, a lot of artists took you know, sketches of it and tried to figure out what he was doing. Uh, the Virgin and Child with St. Anne and Infant St. John that we looked at before. And you can see a lot of similarities. There's this like kind of very heavy structure, making a pyramid, bringing, remember, Christianity down to earth. Uh, we have some of those Leonardo qualities with all this like greenery and water flowing through. Um, to symbolize Mary as, you know, the kind of new mother of all. Um, and then Mary's holding a book 
Uh, and that's pretty standard that it existed for a long time. It refers to uh, specifically in the book of John where it talks about the word made flesh. I talked about that in earlier lectures. Um, so the book kind of shows, you know, prophecy, scripture, and that sort of thing. Um, the goldfinch uh, is a symbol. Uh, goldfinches are seen as rooting around in thorns uh, to be able to get their food. Um, so goldfinch, because of that, is related to Jesus because Jesus, when he was crucified, had a crown of thorns. So uh, this even shows Jesus is a baby. He's kind of embracing his sacrifice that John is handing to him. So kind of like a, a pointing uh, thing going on, similar to what we have over here. Uh, when you get in close again, you can see a lot of Leonardo type stuff going on. He doesn't quite have the sfumato uh, that we see from Leonardo, but a little bit of it. It's not hard lines like had been in the early um, Renaissance work. Uh, and then the background, we see a bridge and some trees uh, and getting a little bit smoky back there. So more sfumato in the background. But this is, as far as art historians go, um, probably considered to be his most important piece. Uh, we're going to look at the School of Athens, which is on the right wall, but it's part of this whole, all of this is painted, kind of amazing, right? Um, it's part of this whole room uh, in the Stanza della Senatura in the Vatican Palace. Uh, so you notice a lot of people are painting for the Pope. Uh, that's where the money's at, so you can do these grand works, uh, and Raphael is aware of that. He's still very young. He was younger than all of the other artists we looked at. Uh, he didn't live very long time. Um, and he was able to get commissions very early because of his talent from what people saw with the Madonnas. Uh, so this one uh, tells, if you were to try to do a summary of what's going on with the so-called high Renaissance, uh, this painting would be a good place to have a summary. Uh, the way the painting is arranged is draw a line through the middle and then think of the um, left and right as being um, one representing kind of spirituality, transcendence, uh, and the other one representing the world, things that are down to earth. Uh, and we see these two figures in the middle representing exactly that. Uh, we have Plato, who is Leonardo is painted as, as Plato, so Raphael lo loved to, to give it up to his influences and to living people. Uh, and he's pointing upwards. And remember the Platonic Academy of Philosophy, their thought was to get reach spirituality, um, to get close to the divine would be to contemplate beauty. Uh, kind of, so kind of showing Leonardo as that. Maybe ironic in a way since Leonardo was, was um, more of an engineer than anything. And then on the other one, we have Aristotle, um, and he's uh, putting his hand over the earth, showing things like the sciences, things that are down to earth. So um, think of one side as the spiritual side, uh, and then think of this other side as the um, profane side or the things that are down to earth. And he populates figures throughout um, kind of on this continuum. Uh, he has Michelangelo as in between. He's on this kind of like uh, spiritual side, but he's also on the physical side as well. Um, and that is despite <laughs> Michelangelo being um, not exactly the nicest person to Raphael. Uh, Michelangelo was prone to jealousy uh, and he may have been, um, had a problem with Raphael getting so much attention so soon. Uh, and also being kind of more socially connected and easy than Michelangelo was, who tend to be kind of tortured. Interestingly, um, Raphael puts himself all the way on the physical side, as far left as possible. Uh, so he's kind of working against, in some ways, the idea of the artist genius uh, by making himself kind of a crass person all the way over here, uh, really down to earth, someone that just creates some pictures. Um, so some humility, people tend, not, tend to appreciate. You may see why Raphael was such a popular guy. So Leonardo and Plato. Um, so Leonardo as Plato. 
He holds Timaeus, which is a book of cosmology and numerology. It's the basis of Neoplatonism. And we had talked about that before, and you can see it's written right there. Uh, so spiritual side, so he's pointing upwards towards the heavens. And then the other side, we have Aristotle, who has a book called Ethics. Uh, it doesn't mean exactly what you think it means. It's more about Aristotle's scientific study of physical phenomena. Um, so in some ways, at the Renaissance, people were moving away from some of the things that Aristotle had said, uh, trying to be more scientific. Um, but he is seen kind of as the first physical scientist. Um, and they put him on this side. So all of those figures on the right and the left are populated in that way. And some may seem kind of odd uh, where they're at. Uh, so if we look at um, on the rational side, so the down to earth side, uh, we have Bramante, um, who is an architect at the time. So architects are definitely making physical things and they have to be, um, be able to make things that are going to last. And he is shown as Euclid. Um, so Euclidean geometry is what you learn in class. Uh, if you take a geometry class in high school, that's what you learn. Uh, if you take advanced math, you might learn other types of geometry. Um, at the time, there was no other type of geometry. Um, he draws a diagram. Uh, it could be, there's a bunch of ideas about what it is. It could be the Star of David, but it also is these two big triangles that are kind of intersecting. It could be a plan for figures in the fresco. Uh, so when you get in close, um, again, it could be either of those things. Um, and if we go back, that's kind of the easiest way to see it. We can see that there's a composition that's made where it's kind of like two intersecting triangles. Uh, so taking this pyramid thing that the other artists had done uh, and basically creating two of them. Uh, so it kind of makes sense if you think about it. Uh, it could be a plan for the figures in the fresco as well. And then um, strangely, uh, on the spiritual side, because we're talking about another person who you learn about in your geometry class, uh, that's the left side. Uh, we have Pythagoras. And um, the reason why he's on that side is because even though he came up with the Pythagorean the theorem that you learn in geometry class and which is very useful, it's still, um, it's still something that's known to be true in Euclidean geometry and not in other types of geometry. Uh, but Pythagoras himself, there had been kind of a legend that grew up around him that he uh, had started a cult. Um, and I call it, I'm not using that in a judgmental sense, just a small kind of religious group. And um, they thought that by contemplating numbers and creating music with certain harmonic ratios, they could get closer to the divine. Uh, so that's why he's on the spiritual side. So the harmonic scale, and again, we're not sure if historically if this is necessarily related to Pythagoras, but the stories around it were believed at the time. Um, ratios that add up to 10. And then uh, we have a book, and it's kind of, um, repeated here, it could be showing tablets like the Ten Commandments. So kind of like a spiritual word that's coming from above. That's what the Ten Commandments are for Christians. Uh, and Pythagoras is, Pythagoras is doing the same thing, uh, kind of thinking about doing physical things on the earth uh, to make a connection with the divine, with the spiritual. And then we have Michelangelo a little bit in the middle. Um, but sort of over towards the spiritual side a little bit. Uh, and Michelangelo is portrayed as Heraclitus. And this is a last minute addition, um, partially because Michelangelo, I mean, he really had it out for uh, Raphael uh, and, you know, perhaps tried to sabotage him and definitely didn't treat him nicely. Uh, but Raphael being kind of like a bigger person, I guess you could say, uh, and not quite as stressed as Michelangelo um, ends up putting him in uh, because he feels like it's important to recognize his influence and how important he is. Uh, and what he's showing is this idea of dynamic equilibrium. Um, and this comes from Heraclitus. The idea is that when you have two opposing forces, uh, you kind of embrace those forces and you can have a dynamic between them and um, kind of move forward with that. Uh, so in a way, he's recognizing how you know, the contradictions of Michelangelo, this artist who creates beautiful things, but who has a personality who's quite grating, um, but also giving this idea of how do you move things forward? 
Uh, and Michelangelo, even at the time, was kind of recognized as being someone that was really pushing things forward. Uh, so by exploring opposites, sometimes people can uh, push things forward. And then there's also this idea of Heraclitus, who wrote Logos, uh, original wisdom. Um, so in other words, Logos literally means word, uh, but Christians eventually uh, interpreted this, and I mentioned this before, to mean kind of the creative power of God. Uh, so high praise, basically, uh, from Raphael for Michelangelo. And he praised him even further by making Michelangelo's body like a body that Michelangelo would paint. So thick, muscular body, um, showing the kind of like big things that Michelangelo is doing. Um, but then Raphael, he's all the way over here with his teacher. There's Raphael, very young. Here's his teacher, Perugino. Um, he's also with Zoroaster um, and Ptolemy. Um, Zoroaster is from what's called modern day Iran. Um, and Ptolemy is, um, both of them are astronomers. Um, and it kind of shows they're just describing the world. You know, we're not trying to interpret it or anything. We're just describing it. So he puts himself as people who describe the world. Again, a certain amount of humility. He's not saying I'm making a great artistic statement. He's saying I'm just showing what I see. Um, so an interesting bit of humility. So with this painting, um, we get these ideas that the high Renaissance artists um, all seem to have is this balance between um, what's real, that rational style that we looked at in the early Renaissance, uh, and then the more spiritual style that we looked at in, in the early Renaissance and putting them together into one thing. Uh, and we definitely have that going on here. But um, over time, you know, you don't always want to do big statements. Sometimes you just want to do something fun. So that's the deal with Galatea. Um, it was inspired by a Florentine uh, Agnolo Poliziano poem uh, that also inspired Botticelli's Venus. Uh, so definitely going a little bit to that spiritual side. And this is considered to be, and I put the quotes up, light mythology. In other words, uh, it's not one of those stories that Christians would relate to Christianity or the sacrifice of Jesus or something along those lines. Uh, I'm not saying it is necessarily light, uh, but it is a cool story. Uh, it's kind of romantic and dramatic. Um, so these lines describe how the clumsy giant uh, Polyphemus sings a love song to the fair sea nymph Galatea, pictured right here. Now she rides across the waves in a chariot drawn by two dolphins, uh, kind, of, kind of fearsome looking dolphins, laughing in his uncouth song while the gay company of other sea gods and nymphs is milling around her. Raphael's fresco shows Galatea with her gay companions. The picture of the giant was to appear elsewhere in the hall. Uh, so the idea is um, there's this giant who loves her because she's beautiful and delicate and she's just like, he tries to, to woo her and she's just like, I don't notice. I'm just living my life and frolicking over here. Uh, so this one, we're starting to see a little bit of what um, we'll see in later styles. Uh, the following style, which doesn't last a long time, but is pretty influential. Uh, you'll notice that there isn't this like big background. This is more like what we saw with Botticelli where everything's pressed up against the picture plane. Um, so pretty, uh, but not necessarily heavy stuff. But he did do portraits, and although portraits were considered to be not quite as um, revered as the types of paintings that we saw, like the School of Athens, uh, it was still uh, considered to be serious, and people started, to, artists started to take it more seriously and want to have more content, not just have a picture of a person, but try to show something about them. So in Raphael's portrait of Baudicere Castione, um, he is trying to show his soul, like what he's about. And he does that in a bunch of different ways. Uh, so Cassione, he wrote a book on manners called The Book of the Courtier. Uh, and he's one of these people who at the time was considered to be kind of like a man of the age, a Renaissance man. Um, and he actually defined what a Renaissance man should be, should be courageous, sagacious, truth loving, skillful, and cultivated. Uh, this word means basically um, wise and being able to communicate your wisdom to others. Um, so he's portraying these ideas in a few ways. First off with the clothes that he's wearing, this hat is a shorthand for someone who is an artist. So like a poet or, um, 
Raphael wouldn't necessarily consider painters like himself to be an artist, but someone like that, someone who creates things with their mind. Um, but there's also a few other things that show he's well off. He's wearing this expensive fur, uh, which is gathered around him. Um, but uh, we get that kind of truthful, truth loving by him looking directly at us. Uh, so oftentimes people will, um, even today, they'll look at someone who meets your eye as someone who's straightforward uh, and truthful. Uh, so we see him portraying uh, uh, Castellone in that way. And his face is also relaxed, um, but not too relaxed. So there's that kind of balance we see in the high Renaissance. Uh, when we get in close, we can see his eyes are, there's a little bit of a sparkle in there. So uh, he has a young man's beard. There's no gray in it, uh, but he has kind of a, a little bit more going on behind, behind the eyes. Uh, so this is something you can kind of do on your on your own. Um, I would pause the video first, um, but you can kind of compare and contrast these and think about what's different between these two pictures. And it'll help us to understand what's going on with this one on the left, which is the new Venetian style uh, compared to, and it's also going on at the same time as the paintings we looked at, compared to the high Renaissance style that you're familiar with of Raphael. Um, so when you kind of, compare and contrast these, there's some similarities, but there's some differences. This Venetian style is actually going to be uh, quite different. So now would be a good time for you to pause, take a break, um, and then I would say come back and um, we'll do this Venetian style. And remember this Venetian style, even though it's not as famous, will be more influential. So make sure you pay attention to some of the ideas. So hopefully you got a break and got some tea or something like that, and let's move on. Uh, so when we're talking about the Venetian painting, uh, it's being made at the same time as the art from the High Renaissance that we've been looking at. Uh, but again, it has an influence that's um, bigger than what a lot of the other artists that we've been looking at so far have. Um, so the first artist we'll look at, who's considered to be kind of the first one in this style, is Giorgione. Uh, but we're not sure about some of his paintings because we'll look at his student, Titian. Some of them may have been done by his student as well. Uh, so Venetian painting was a little bit different uh, than what uh, the artists in Rome or Florence were doing. Uh, and one of the things that was different about it is that they were really fond of using this medium uh, that was popular with the Dutch, uh, which is oil on canvas. And because of what oil on canvas can do, uh, and if you did the comparison in this previous slide, you may have noticed it, there's a lot more natural colors. You can get, um, you know, the bright colors, but you can also get all of the colors in between. Uh, so oil has an ability to have an endless number of colors. Uh, whereas using other mediums like fresco or tempera, there's a limited color palette. The other thing that oil can do is you can layer paint on top of it and you can have paint show through. Uh, so you can get these incredible flesh tones that they have in these paintings. Whereas Raphael is kind of it's almost like these figures don't have any blood in them. So this picture, um, and we see this with some of the Venetian paintings, where it's not always obvious what the subject is. So this is called the Tempest, uh, but it could also be representing Adam and Eve. Uh, and if it was that, um, there's a few ideas uh, that could represent it. Um, we could see this as the Garden of Eden uh, in the background, looks like a nice place to be, but we see the masculine and feminine figure outside. They're also clothed. Um, it could be that in that case, the lightning bolt is representing God. So kind of portraying him as Zeus. Uh, after the first sin, he kicks Adam and Eve out. Uh, and then the columns, which are broken, could represent death. Uh, so remember, Christians believe that the first sin of Adam and Eve uh, caused uh, death to happen for human beings in a quite literal way. Uh, and then the draped nudity could represent shame and carnal knowledge. Uh, we see that with Eve. Uh, and on the background, we have this kind of like city of earthly paradise. So it comes from ideas that are coming from ancient Greece, uh, this kind of idealistic way of looking at ancient Greece. So it's Christian yet pagan at the same time. Uh, and we can already see the like warmth of the colors, meaning we have like undertones in this flesh tones to be able to bring out these figures, make them more breathing and alive. And that's what oil on canvas does so well. 
Uh, so when you get in close, we can see her rosy cheeks. Uh, she has something underneath her flesh and lots of plants going on as well. So this one, uh, sometimes it's considered to be Georgiane. Uh, sometimes it's considered to be Titian. And Titian will live a long time and he'll be the most influential artist in this style. And this one's called Pastoral Symphony. Uh, so pastoral is this concept uh, that will kind of come up to you later on, but it's the idea that there's a perfect level of civilization. Uh, and some ancient Greeks believe this, and then some people um, during this time in Italy also believed it. The idea that you have, um, you know, it's not good to be what people were before, uh, and in their kind of like ethnocentric uh, white supremacist way, uh, whenever the new world was discovered, a lot of people looked at the way that Native Americans were living and say, that's the old way. Um, and, but at the same time, many Italians uh, looked at around them and said, it's too urbanized. You know, our cities are dirty and crowded and, um, you know, there's lots of crime and, and it's just not something that I want. So there's this idea of a perfect balance where you have so-called civilization, uh, but it's kind of slower and easier and more natural. Uh, so one of the ways you can portray this is by looking at sheep herders. So we literally have sheep in the background in this pastoral symphony. Uh, and it's supposed to be this idyllic balance between um, civilization and um, cities and towns and uh, just being totally on your own and, and being almost like animalistic. So um, the shepherd uh, came to be in Venice uh, to equal the idea of poetry and being a poet um, at this time meant that you would compose to music. Uh, so this actual painting um, style came to be known as poesia, painting to evoke moods like poetry. Uh, so the way you're supposed to read this is kind of interesting uh, and it'll be really relevant later on because it's it's a little weird but it becomes a convention that everybody understands so when you look at this picture how you're supposed to read it is these two clothed young men who are composing a poetry they're real then these two nude figures feminine nude figures aren't real instead they represent the creativity of these two young men uh, so that's why uh, when you see these pictures, you're probably like, why are, why are all these naked women hanging out with these dudes who are fully dressed? Uh, the idea isn't that they're actually there. Instead, um, like the male nude before, the feminine nude starts to represent certain ideas. Uh, and that's also why they make the figures uh, these kind of like idealized, super soft uh, women who almost seem like they don't have bones. This again kind of shows that they're not real uh, the representations of ideas. Uh, so the one over here, uh, pretty standard way, we're going to see this image happening over and over again. She's taken from the fountain of creativity. Um, so again, she represents an idea and isn't, isn't supposed to be really there. Uh, and then the woman holding the flute, um, again, kind of showing um, the composition of poetry. Uh, so she's looking on, but remember, she's not actually there. Uh, these two figures are there, and she's a representation of, of the ideas of creativity. So we get to this one, and what I always ask the class is, which is which? So this Titian painting is called Sacred and Profane Love. Sacred means things that are related to um, spiritual things, things that are heavenly, um, gods, and then profane are things that are related to um, the real world, the physical world. So what I usually do is I ask the class um, to say which one represents sacred and which one represents profane. Uh, so pause it now and make your pick and don't worry if you're wrong and then I'll come back and I'll explain to you what the right answer is. So if you wrote down your answer, um, <laughs> uh, let's see what happened. So the person who is actually representing profane love is the woman over here with the clothing. And then sacred love is the woman who is not wearing any clothing. So um, profane literally means not concerned with religion or religious purposes. Uh, so remember when we looked at this one previously, the feminine nude came to represent an idea. That's what's happening here. The feminine nude is representing something that's perfect and spiritual. Like we saw with Botticelli, 
in Venus, um, this idea of contemplating beauty. Whereas the profane, the earthly things are represented over here. She's wearing a fancy dress. She has fancy jewelry. Um, she's kind of like collecting things. Uh, she's representing things that are on the earth. Uh, and we see the same things uh, in the background. Um, we have a castle here. You know, castles are built to protect people um, from wars. And then over here, we have a church. Um, so she is our sacred um, and she is our profane. So many people would guess that she is the profane because she's nude. Uh, and that's more of, that's something you want to be careful about because you don't want to take your modern ideas uh, and, and put them onto uh, the way that people look at uh, symbols in earlier times. Um, but if you think about it, if you thought that this was profane to have a feminine nude, um, it's something that you might want to explore because it comes along with this idea uh, that being naked or showing your body is something that is uh, shameful. Um, and a lot of that comes from kind of patriarchal ways of looking at the role of women that we've already talked about before. Um, so this is definitely coming from a patriarchal culture, but in this case, uh, the feminine nude is representing this neoplatonic love like we saw in Venus. Um, and again, we see the oil and canvas medium. It can make her like really warm. Uh, even though she's representing an idea, not necessarily a real person, she seems like she has actual flesh. She seems like she has blood going through her veins. Uh, and then here we have our profane woman. Again, she's kind of thinking about earthly things, making earthly things. So that's why it's profane in this setup. Um, so this painting uh, ends up being uh, very influential. Uh, and we'll see other artists will kind of be recalling uh, this style of painting. So Titian really made it. Uh, he was appointed the official painter of Venice in 1516. Uh, and this particular painting was uh, commissioned by Jacobo Pizarro, who's a bishop and an admiral of the papal fleet. So back then, religious people, like, uh, they rolled a little bit different, differently. Um, so this is called the Madonna of the Pizarro family for that reason. So Pizarro and his family are portrayed here away from the sacred figures and profiles. So that's a pretty standard way. Um, but this is also showing um, the kind of early Italian involvement in, um, in the imperialism of the New World, um, but also um, kind of wars that they have uh, with people in the Middle East as well, uh, and the kind of imperial designs that have been going on for a long time. So in Italy, uh, I kind of mentioned this before, uh, trade with um, the East. It basically goes through what we can now call the Middle East. Uh, and so Italians fought, many Italian city-states fought many wars uh, to kind of control that type of trade. Uh, so in one of these wars, the Venetians had defeated the Turks in the 1502 venetian -Turk turkish War. So it may be why they're showing this guy with a turban who's kind of below all the other figures. Um, some of the other figures are here. We have St. Peter, that's obvious because he wears blue and yellow. Uh, this figure could represent St. George, who slayed the dragon, we had talked about him before. And then this is definitely St. Francis. Uh, and we know it is because he's wearing a cloak with three knots on it. Um, and then we have Jesus and Mary at the top of this pyramid. Um, but the pyramid is off center. It's not what we had seen um, in the other Renaissance painters. So we're already seeing a little bit more dynamic um, compositions, but also uh, more of this kind of like Michelangelo influence. And you can see in the weight of the figures and the way that they're arranged in a way that's a little bit more dramatic. Uh, so Kleiner says, a new kind of pictorial design, one built on movement rather than repose. So out of the artists we had looked at, uh, Michelangelo was definitely the one that wanted to have this kind of movement that goes beyond the painting. Um, and Titian is doing the same thing. And this will be really influential in the pictures. You can compare it to this early Renaissance style, which seems rather still in comparison. Um, part of it is when you just have everything arranged in a line in the center, uh, you tend to focus on the center and nothing really moves. Whereas if you put your kind of focus off center, then your eye tends to want to move around 
but also the way that the figures are leaning this way and that way um, gives you, and, and we can see all these motions that seem to be in time, gives you this idea of the dynamic of things moving. Um, so some of these pictures uh, are, it's almost like they're taking the things like Botticelli had done, but using the, the possibilities of um, oil on canvas to create more colors and create something even more beautiful. Uh, and believe it or not, this is like a real, this is going to be a really popular um, theme or subject later on throughout the class. And it's probably because it gives a, a painter a chance to, to have a little bit of fun. Uh, and this is the meeting of Bacchus and Ariadne. Um, Bacchus in ancient Greece uh, is known as Dionysus. Uh, and he's thought to be the god of um, wine and song and partying and just having fun. Um, and so these pictures come to be known as Bacchanals. And it's basically a bunch of people. You can see, you know, there's music, um, there's people drinking, sometimes getting wasted and passed out. Uh, there's all kinds of mythical creatures. There's dogs. Dogs kind of represent like um, down to earth type of desires. Uh, and then for some reason it becomes part of it to show like leopards uh, pulling chariots. Uh, and believe it or not, we're going to see this like several hundred years later. Uh, so these Bacchanals are a way to show all of these like down to earth kind of desires, but in a way that's acceptable at this time. So in this story, Theseus abandons Ariadne on Gnosis. Uh, after Ariadne basically saved Theseus's life, uh, he's not very, very cool. And then Bacchus takes her as his bride. Um, and then we see that Laocoon picture, basically sculpture that we had looked at earlier, the Laocoon and his sons that have recently been rediscovered. And Titian throws it in there exactly how he's portrayed. Um, so Laocoon is back. So this idea, the Serpentina, uh, form becomes very popular. And then this last one, um, this is one where the feminine nude is in theory representing an idea, uh, but is also representing exactly what you think it is. Uh, so this is the Venus of Urbino, uh, and it was commissioned by the Duke of Urbino, and who is being pictured is his girlfriend. So elite people at this time um, they would get married, but the marriages are basically business transactions. Uh, you're bringing together two elite families for elite people. For people who are poor, it's not necessarily the same. Um, you're bringing together two families, uh, and you're expected to create children. But um, it's also uh, kind of accepted at this time that because you're not being married for that reason, there wasn't necessarily a relationship with sexuality and marriage. Um, you would have a side person. Uh, and in some places, women could have like kind of a side man um, or a side woman if they wanted to. Uh, but it was men definitely had more power to do this sort of thing. Uh, so this is his girlfriend. Uh, and the, the Duke of Urbino had kind of a vacation house, more or less, where he would um, meet his girlfriend. Uh, and it would basically operate as that and a man cave. So a painting like this, you would commission, it would be covered up most of the time. And then when he had his boys over, he'd be like, you know, he pulled the curtain like we see the curtain here uh, and be able to show this idea. But since you're not allowed to be like flat out, just show a naked woman for titillation, uh, she's portrayed in such a way that um, it doesn't quite mean that. So a couple of things are going on to help that happen. First off, you have these columns and this kind of ancient looking clothing to make it look like it's in ancient Rome. So they're saying, okay, this isn't just um, a hot woman who's naked. Uh, instead, it's also representing an idea of purity like we'd seen before. Um, and she's kind of demure, she's covering up her genitals. Uh, so it's one of these things where it's, you can look at it a couple of ways. You could say, um, you know, she's pure, but also you can look at it as a way as um, men having control over women and access. Uh, so she's kind of relaxed in the way she's covering it up. Then um, to go along with the kind of like carnal ideas, we have the dog. Uh, and dogs show a couple of things. Um, they can show, you know, dogs will do what they want physically whenever they want to, but it also shows loyalty. 
Um, so uh, again, this kind of um, strange contradiction that men have at this time about women, which unfortunately lasts sometimes uh, into the world today. So also a symbol of fidelity, so both at the same time. Oh, I love that his name, his personal name, the Duke of Urbino at this time is Guido Baldo. <laughs> it's a great name. Uh, so when you get in close, one thing that artists knew um, when they're doing oil on ca canvas is that it would crack over time, but it would do it in a very pleasing way. Uh, so we can see the cracks even when we get closer. But again, she's kind of like this idealized figure. She's impossibly soft. Um, it's almost like she has no bones, uh, no knuckles on her fingers. So this is an idealized figure at the time, this kind of ultimate femininity and youth. Uh, and when you get in close, you can really see this kind of like blood. This is what um, oil on canvas does really well. You put layers and you have undertones so that people seem to be kind of glowing from within, full of life. So Titian, uh, kind of interestingly, you can see here the influence of Michelangelo. That's some, <laughs> some big Jesus going on right there uh, in the crown with thorns. Um, but uh, over time, he actually starts to uh, get old and his vision goes. Uh, and he starts to create things that are really interesting um, in that he's using heavy impasto. And if you see one of these paintings in person, there's a really good one at the DIA right now. If you see these paintings in person, you'll see that there's like big old paint strokes in these later ones. Uh, so he made this when he was 80 to 82 years old. And um, he did it partially because he just couldn't see very well. Uh, but what artists would notice later on is that by doing fewer paint strokes and kind of bigger ones, uh, what's called painterly, um, that you can express your individuality. Like only you can do these big old paint strokes uh, that are done rather quickly uh, and nobody else can do it quite like you do. So it's a way for artists to show their individuality and expression. Uh, so necessity uh, becomes the mother of invention in this, in this case. And you can really compare. We have like smaller paint strokes. The paint strokes kind of disappear. If I told you, hey, this was Michelangelo, you might say, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but with this, what Titian is doing something um, with these big old paint strokes, he's doing something that only he can do because it comes with movements that are very particular and hard to copy. Uh, 